<clears throat> Jeremiah is back with part two of R.C.D. Mashushki. How to pronounce that name? I don't know, but uh, uh, pardon me if you are of the Arsene family. Now, we, we, we're um, obviously making a lot of these artists more well-known. Uh, exposure makes exposure. But we are here to glorify Jesus Christ, and we do mention the names of these gentlemen. And uh, we do um, uh, look at these paintings and some of these guys and, and their skill and and you're seeing places that you, you, you may never get a chance to go. Uh, they will ne they'll never be the same. The, the, the sunset, the light, the color, the trees. Uh, obviously, during the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, you will have a lot of beauty to see. However, we're looking at history, and it's, I, I really like these paintings from a, from a, from a perspective of history. From the, this, man has a, this boy has a fishing pole here, probably. You know, this, this, is, this is life in the raw, and it's beautiful, and... And Mr. A&M here, Mr. Green, uh, he likes, you know, accentuating colors, and I like that. I like how he's accentuating colors and probably uh, augmenting them more than they are kind of thing. And this is what gives these people personality. 18th and 19th century paintings are really what I like the most. Now let's continue as we look at Luke 21. We talked about the previous video, we talked about how these people are listening to the master give a sermon or teaching, and the teaching is about multiple scenarios. The first scenario we skipped in 21 was the woman who gave out of, she gave everything she had, and how Jesus is very, sat, very happy and satisfied with her uh, giving what all she has, and how people who have a whole lot give a little, it's a different scenario and so forth. We're going to skip that from 21. That goes in line with giving to the church and alms and so forth. We're going to skip that for now. Let's go directly to the prophecy. Now let's go to, um, first of all, we, we, we talked about terrified in verse 9. Be not terrified. We talked about how people are taking advantage of these, of these end times. Um, online, especially with these podcasts, and they're fear casting people. Now some of the things they're saying are true. They're warranted, and, and these are very caring people. Don't misunderstand me. Some of these are MAGA people, whatever. Uh, uh, but but we, we, we will clarify what's going on, right? This is Jeremiah Michael Pearson with New Covenant. We do everything in one name. We constantly talk about uh, absent from the body is present with the Lord. And that is our chief crown, the thing that we're happiest about. That's what Paul means in Thessalonians. The thing that we are really happy about is getting out of here. The thing that we're really happy about is... No more suffering, no more pains. Uh, as far as making America great again, you're never really going to make America great again because it's not biblical. Now, you may make America better, which is cool, but it's not going to be great or like the, the original 13 colonies or there was even slavery then. So I mean, what's the point? Point is, is that is that <gasps> the Bible says things are going to get worse. So that's what's going to happen. Furthermore, you might make America great in your own neighborhood or something, but you have 35% of the population in the United States right now who say that talking to children and perversions and transgendering is okay. You're looking at 35% of the population, so you're looking at mass psychosis right now. You're looking at zombieism, which is really growing. Fortunately, the MAGA crowd and a lot of people who have half a brain who, who, who believe in decency and applying for citizenship and, and, uh, and so on, and scooby dooby dooby uh, people who are, um, the Greek word is dikeo, uh, they like to do things right. Let's put it that way, okay? Uh, they're going to slow this process down dramatically, right? When the rapture happens, if, uh, Christians aren't going to be here. Half of the MAGA crowd will pro probably be in the rapture, and so the Joe Biden types or whatever types of freaky people, they're going to really take over. Because he that restraineth is gone. He that restraineth is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is in Christians. So when Christians leave, everything's going to go buck wild here. Satan worship's going to take over, who knows, like they had in the Grammy Awards here the other day, where they had Satan and people were bowing down to him in the Grammy Awards. So obviously that kind of stuff is going to blow up here big time. 
and you have to make a decision as to the, taking the mark and the number of the beast, etc. Let's get back to terrifying. So is he talking to the disciples? No. However, he is talking to them about being terrified uh, in terms of what they're going to face, these guys. They're, they're going to face some tough times. And the Lord's going to allow it as he has declared. And he also told them it's good for them because it is a testimony in stone that you love God and that you're standing up for the truth and you're manning up when you, you know, when you could man up. You know, a, a police officer came over here the other day. That guy is willing to die for my car stereo. Okay, that's a pretty tough dude. Okay, if he's willing to die for my car stereo, someone's jumping in my car. Maybe I should man up a little too over here, John Wayne style. I mean, you know, I don't want to run and hide. I don't want to, to um, what, what am I trying to say? I don't want to, to be terrified. I, it's time to man up a little bit, toughen up. Yes, you could be a, a victim of some of these people. Uh, the lady around the corner here was shot in the face. It, it was horrible. She was on the news here the other day. Listen, it, it is getting bad, and it's always been bad. But the point is that let's not be terrified, as the Master has said, because he's not really talking to the disciples. He's talking to us. Because the earthquakes are now, and all this is happening to us. Nation is rising against nation. There are like seven wars going on right now. China's threatening Taiwan, and that would make one more. I think that makes seven or so. The Houthis are fighting this, and Gaza's fighting them, and the Ukraine's fighting him. Finland's trying to fight all people trying to cross their border. They're trying to just cross the border. That goes for, I think, Romania, Hungary. People are trying to cross the border, and I tell them you can't cross, and they're still trying to cross, as they do here. So the point is that, you know, it's, it's like wars all over the place. We have a war on the border between the cartel and uh, the border agents. Mexico has wars internally with, between gang members and so forth, and drug gangs, or this drug gang, and, and you know, and there's wars everywhere. There's still a, the, the, the original drug cartel in Colombia. They haven't gone anywhere. So war here, war there, and uh, so does Jesus Christ know what he's talking about? Everything the master says come, comes to fruition. I remember years ago, there weren't that many earthquakes and, 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 you know, and so forth. And I was thinking, you know, where are the earthquakes? Well, wonder no more. Turn your news on. And great earthquakes. First of all, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilence and fearful sights. And great signs shall there be from heaven. Now, this is before the end of the world, and, of course, that's what it means. We're going to have an eclipse here coming up. Uh, they say now that the clouds are going to cover it, so you won't even notice it, maybe. Let's continue, which might be for, uh, uh, good. I mean, I, I think that might be a good idea, but the uh, Father knows what he's doing. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places. Uh, verse 12, but before all these, they shall, but before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogue and to prisons, be, being bought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. So now we're bouncing around again. Now he's going back into time. See, he, he went to the end of the world. Now he's talking to them when he says, but. Uh, Father God, is he, he lives in a multidimensional world. We, we, we tend to think about our own life, which makes sense, but not the Master. He is multidimensional. He lives in all time frames. This is a nice painting here. Uh, interesting. Let's move on. This is a nice little drawing, quick kind of thing from our uh, artist in here. Let's move on. Uh, this is a, a, a interesting in many ways. It's kind of a practice drawing maybe for him. I don't know. This is nice. Once again, I call it Mr. Green for a reason. He really likes green a lot, and uh, I think it's beautiful here. It's, it's nothing really uh, along the lines of maybe one of his best paintings, of course. Let's move on. We continue with Luke 21, and look at this beautiful painting. This is pretty nice. It has a nice original white there. It's, I like that kind of water thing there. Uh, you know, there, there's something in some of these lesser paintings, but you have to take time and look at them. You know, you have to sit, sit and look and, uh, and absorb, but we don't have time for that right now. We're going to move on because we're going to get rid of 
through Mr. Arsene here, who likes colors all over the place, especially green, I think. But let's move on. Here he is back to Mr. Mr. Green again. I think this is a very good painting here. You know, this is pretty nice. Uh, he may not be considered one of the best or something, but uh, this is a very nice painting. Let's go to Luke 21. Let's continue as he changes gears and tells them that they're going to go preach the gospel. And let's, let's, let's look at for my name's sake. Let's look at that for a moment. The end of verse 12. What, what does that mean, Jeremiah? It means that Jesus' name means go and love people and help people. That's what it means. It means go and give people eternal life who are, who, who are locked into their grandparents' sin. They're locked into their own sin. And, and to unlock this attachment, you're going to bring the gospel to them, announcing peace between you and God and a future of peace for you if you do what? Take the gospel of peace. So that's the key. Now, people who are out there in the world and the devil, they're not going to be too happy about you bringing eternal life to people because they are essentially death. They love death. They love seeing other people die. So why would they be happy with you bringing life? They're not. They weren't happy with Jesus Christ bringing life, and they're not going to be happy with you bringing life. Well, that's where we have persecution and affliction, correct? This is also applicable to Paul talking about enduring hardships. Or James, manifold tribulations. Right? Or do not think it strange, these things coming upon you. Various different kinds of troubles is all this means. And, and there are all different kinds of troubles. There, there, there's trouble with you being uh, chastened. The Lord might chasten you, and he'll put you in trouble, basically, and, and you're getting spanked. So that there's many, many approaches to what we might call adversity, okay, and agonizo, uh, agony and so forth. Let's let that go, all those terms. We're not going to clarify that right now. I just wanted to point out, terrified is what a lot of people are going to be but it's not even the end of the world. It's right before. Now let's continue. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. So this is extremely significant right here. Everybody basically needs a testimony of the love of Jesus Christ and standing up for the truth. And when you stand up for the gospel in real time, it, 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 is, it is something that, that re fights against your standing before the Son of God for your assessment day and judgment day. It, 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 it is a time for you to have concrete evidence that you participated in, in the church. And there's nothing like having concrete evidence that you were in the church and participating for the purposes of saving souls planting and watering human beings in love and truth. And, and that's what you're doing. This also refers to someone who is, who is going to receive some sort of accolades uh, in terms of rewards. Because when you get a reward for a testimony, so to speak, it's not you purchasing your salvation. And, and, let, and let's, let, let's clarify this. When you have a love testimony, you need a love testimony because it's required for you to love the Lord with all of your heart. However, it, there's also an aspect to this in terms of the Bema seat, meaning there's going to be silver, bronze, and gold medals given to people based upon their testimony and their activity. So there are two aspects to this. One is, you're getting into heaven by the finished work of Jesus Christ, and by you repenting and confessing your sins, that is, that's what's required of you, and that's how come you're saved. The, 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 the finished work of Jesus Christ is applied to you. Your sins are removed in an instant by you confessing scientifically 
what's going on here. And what's scientifically going on here is, is that you need to go downstairs because you're a sinner. Now you confess that, you, that that's where you're going and you don't want to go. I don't want to go downstairs. I want to be saved. Save me. I will do what you have commanded me to do. I will confess my sins. I will confess the, the replacement sufferings of the lovable Jesus Christ and move on. And now I am forgiven and I have removed the, I have the removal of my sin, which is called remission, and the kingdom of God is now mine. It was at hand, as the Master has said, and I took it. Through the humiliation of my own self before the presence of God at the River Jordan. And once I do that, guess who comes down? Mr. King himself. The king will not show up unless you act like a servant. Unless you act like a subject, why would he hang around you? Because he's king and you ain't. So you, you've acknowledged scientifically what's going on. I, I don't deserve anything. He's king. I, I, I'm a nobody. And will you save me, Mr. Nobody? And he says, I will save you because you have gotten yourself back in line. Getting back in line is what, is what this is all about. Knowing your role. What is my real role? What is my scientific role here, Jeremiah? I'm telling you your scientific role. Unless you become a scientist, you'll never see Jesus Christ. Never. Your dictionary calls it actualization. Unless you start confessing what's real, you'll never see Mr. Real. Unless you confess the truth, you'll never see Mr. Truth. Forget about it. If you embrace the truth and then you start embracing lies, you're going to lose Mr. Truth. That's why John said they left us because they were not of us. Now, let's get back to prophecy more germane here. It shall turn to you for a testimony. Now, there are two testimonies going on here. There's a testimony of those who love Jesus Christ, and then there's a testimony of those who are going to receive punishment for attacking the people he loves. He, the, Jesus said, I came down here for people who love love and love the truth. That's who I came down here for. And you better leave them alone. It's better for you to, to commit suicide than to go bothering people who love me, who love truth, and are caring people. It's better for you to go ahead and wipe yourself out than for you to go hurting innocent people and, and, and running around here like gang members and, and attacking people who are caring people. And it goes on your record that you attack people minding their own business and you enjoyed it. You just gave your own testimony of your own hell. And, and that's where you're going to go. Based upon simple facts. That's why, we, that's why we rejoice in Revelation 18 so much because the Master said he's going to give people what they're going to get and it's all over. Rejoice over her, ye heavens. Heavens uh, uh, is full of people who have been hurt, lied, and, and, and abused and Jesus is saying you can rejoice over them now because the people who did all of this stuff uh, hurting you and the Pope who wiped out civilizations and slaughtered thousands and thousands of people, minding their own business, especially Protestants, joining the Muslims and doing so, Jews, etc., they're, they're, uh, they're going to get it now. So you people can rejoice over them right now. In other words, it's your time to be uh, a little happy. Let's put it that way. What goes up must come down, and the valleys become the mountains, and the mountains become the valleys. Because the axe was laid at the root of the trees, and now it's time to chop them down. And those who were trees were warned, get out of there, Babylon, get out of these organizations. Oh, don't participate with their deeds, don't do it. Revelation 18. And all the people said, hallelujah, 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 in the next chapter, right? They're saying, praise God, boy, thank you, Jesus. We praise you for, for getting these bad guys. Take them out the game, as we say here in America. Take them out. 
There's no love loss for us, for them. We're not exactly happy that they're going downstairs, but, but it, 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 if they ask for it, give it to them. That's the point here. We have a famous actor in the United States who made a movie where he said, make my day. In other words, I'm going to take out a thug today who likes to harm innocent people, so make my day. Make my day. That's what's going on here. Make my day. We Christian people preach mercy 24-7 here, forgiveness. Uh, but there comes a time when we're going to say hallelujah to the, the, uh, the, the Superman, Batman, and, and they go take out the, 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 the trash. I saw a guy walking Speedway here the other day, and he had his pants all the way down. I don't know how his pants stayed up. But I could tell he was like a little velociraptor walking in there. He was considering robbing the store or shooting somebody. Okay, it's going to be a good time when we see all these kinds of people get, get them out of our face permanently. Thank you, Jesus. Revelation chapter 17, 18. Wrap it up. Let's move on. This painting here is not one of my favorites, but it's a nice painting. It's a nice original painting, heavy in color. For those of you who like green, you are going to like arsony. He's actually number 12 on my list. I almost said 13. He's 12. Nice, colorful jobs of greens here. He is Mr. Green, and it's beautiful green for me. I really like him. Here he is back to green again. Now he's trying to do what Norman did, our... Uh, our number 11 uh, guy, well, the guy right before him, as a matter of fact, uh, the gentleman. They're both obviously Nordic of some sort of Norway or uh, maybe, I don't know, um, they, they could be Swedish or uh, maybe even Belgium or something. Who knows? Finland might be logical. Jeremiah, are you on fire? Listen, we're, we're enjoying getting into these paintings and, and kind of picking them apart a little bit. And we're obviously getting into some deep prophecy here. As um, as we wrap up, uh, Mr. Mr. Green here, and uh, this is a nice one here. I don't consider this necessarily uh, uh, one of his better paintings, but it, it's interesting. I don't think it's anything along the lines here. Here he is again. Once again, he's heavy. He likes that green. He likes the Indian red there. It's, he likes Indian red, doesn't he? I mean, it's almost... Uh, fire engine red. It's kind of Indian brown red or something here. And I, I used to know my colors a little better. I used to paint a little. I'm starting to forget them. But anyway, this is a nice painting here. We're going to go right by this one too. Um, uh, this one's okay for me. Um, let's move on. Now this is probably one of his better paintings. Th this one strikes a mood. Now let me, let me share with you. This reminds me of a painter number two on my list. Mr. Scenery. Um, I don't... I don't really have enough paintings to justify calling Isaac Mr. Leviticus Mr. Scenery. However, he only has a few paintings, and I think he's the best scenery painter I've ever seen. I, I really do. Um, this guy right here gives me a nice scene right here. Um, he doesn't usually give me uh, outstanding scenery, but I think this is one of them. This kind of has a little bit of a, a, a beauty to it. That's my opinion, but... You may not think so. It's a little dark for me. Um, this reminds me of the Aachen Boys. This, that's one of my knocks on the Aachen Boys. 50% of their paintings are too dark and they're too blurry in many areas. Otherwise, I would rate those guys pretty high. They, they might be the best detail painters of all time um, for, on many levels, but um, especially for people. But let's move on. As this is a beauty here. Let, let's get some scripture going with this one as you, as you absorb this one here. This is a nice one from him. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being bought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. So here we go, trying to establish righteousness, uh, teach purity, teach love, teach truth, and, and the devil and his minions and people who are wicked all together are going to get together, and they're going to not be happy campers, that you are exposing what they're doing, and you're calling it like a T.I.S., for I will give you a mouth and wisdom with all your adversaries 
shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. So he's going to give Christian people the ability to say the right words and have the right response and to discern the proper thoughts for what's going on with your discussion with these people in terms of court time and so forth. And you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. We're, going, we're back to for my name's sake again. Now, one of the main cross-references to this is Matthew 10 and elsewhere, where we get our first, I'm going to send you boys out, here's what you're going to do. Here's what you're going to face, right? And of course, we see that cross-reference here to Matthew 10, uh, two times here, right? Yeah, we have a cross-reference here to 17, to Matthew 10, and a cross-reference here to Matthew 10, 30, and that is 18. So the master tells you two times that I know every hair of your head and they're going to hate you because you're preaching truth and righteousness and these are wicked people. They don't want you identifying them as who they really are. So that's part of what's going on here, obviously. And when he mentions he knows the hairs of your head, he decided to mention it twice here, uh, well, the reference to Matthew 10 and the reference here. And why is he doing that? Now, let's talk about that for a moment. And this is very significant. The reason why he's mentioning this is because you need to know that Jesus Christ is Mr. Know-it-all, do-it-all. He, he knows everything about you. If he knows how many hairs are on your head, that means that if something happens to you, he is not going to let it be permanent. That's what he's saying. This is also significant in terms of whether or not you are disfigured or not. Very significant right here. I know the hairs of your head and all. Listen, listen, if you can't... <laughs> I mean, this is very significant. Let's move on. We get to another beautiful painting of this. A nice mood painting here, kind of. Here we have another one. A beautiful tree job here. We'll get right through this one. This is a nice painting. This isn't too bad. Let's, uh, let's continue as we look at verse 18, which is very significant pertaining to... Uh, not one hair of your head shall perish, which is, and let's say that one more time. What he's saying is, is, that, is that even though you may be disfigured, murdered, or even, even mutilated, which, which happens, he's going to let it happen. That's what he's saying. And don't you be worried about it because I'm not going to let them damage you permanently. In other words, not one, not a hair of your head perish. Okay, stop right there. How can that be true if he's going to allow you to be murdered and so forth and even disfigured or something like that? And of course, die. How, how can that happen unless you are Mr. Supernatural and you can resurrect people and you can do as you did with Lazarus? That's the point, okay? He's casually telling them that I'm going to resurrect you no matter what happens exactly the way you were before you were uh, abused, destroyed, whatever. Whatever term you want to use, okay? Damage might be a good word. Or disfigured or whatever, right? It's also applicable to you dying. That's very significant. Human beings go on the grave. They do not maintain their figure. He's telling you all that, wait a minute, not one hair is going to perish? Very interesting. Let's go on to 19. In your patience, possess you your souls. Now, now we're getting into some heavy stuff pertaining to number 19 in this ministry, which is Christianity is basically two periods. Christianity is basically initiation, proper, right, Protestant way, and then it's patience. Patience is number two as to the two victories you have. Because you had a victory when you, when you ignore the lies 
um, don't go re re repent and be baptized. That's your first victory. Your second victory is what the Master says right here, that you're going to have to be patient here, and you're going to have to wait, and it's going to be difficult. In jail, wherever you are. And that's intermittently uh, experienced, by the way. Okay? The emotional aspect of this is, you might say, John 16. I'm going to let men take your joy away from you. In other words, you're walking around, you're happy-go-lucky, and the joy is gone. And why is it gone? Because Jesus has allowed somebody to come after you. And the reason they're coming after you is because you are proclaiming freedom to the captives. And the people who want to keep them captive are not happy. They're making obviously money off them, and they're enjoying their torture. Some people enjoy torture. Hell enjoys torturing people. That's one of their main characteristics, unfortunately. However, all of their torture comes back on them uh, as we look at the Libra scale, don't we? I told you the Libra scale is monstrous in the sky. And if you study your astrology, you can study my astrology here. I give you some astrology here. The Libra scale means that God is not mocked. Whatsoever you sow, that you shall also reap. Your sin will find you out. End of story. Now we have a couple more scriptures. I'm going to shut now. This is a nice painting here. You know, we're, we're, we're doing more studying now than we are looking at the paintings right now because we're getting to some heavy stuff here. Now, I like this. This is, this is an Impressionist style. I like the browns in there. I like how he has, has put some purple in there and so forth. It's got some violet flowers there and so forth, and I think it's nice. I think it's a pleasant painting. Uh, and once again, he obviously likes a lot of color. He is also definitely an Impressionist realist. He likes a lot of Impressionist painting. And as you know, I'm an Impressionist fan too. Uh, I'm going to show you some Monet paintings. Monet is a fabulous painter. Um, he had a lot of skill that he didn't like to show, kind of. I wish he would have gotten a little more realism. I'll show you some of those paintings that I really like. Some of my favorite paintings are Monet's. Not just for personality um, and individualism, like a Van Gogh, but more along the lines of, uh, of his ability to, to, to present original stuff. Because Monet is famous for saying things like, I want to learn to paint all over again. I, I, in other words, he understands that he learned things and that it ruined his creativity to some degree because he wants to be a very original painter. And he, he, he I'm paraphrasing him, I don't want to do that, but um, he said, I want to paint things originally. And he also wants to do, as all these other painters want to do, they, they want to give you a personal perspective and they, they want to give you a, what, what's known as an impression which is an emotional kind of look. You know, it's kind of like you took a quick look, but you don't remember what you saw. Uh, you know, and, uh, and I think that's very important from, from my perspective of art. Obviously, I like things just the way they are. We're, we're going to get into some pictures in high def here shortly, and we'll, we'll be going through some scriptures too, like we're doing right now. And right now, we're into prophecy, okay? That's 16 in this ministry, and uh, we're really enjoying this. We're just about done, though. I like the colors in this, and let's move on. I like the contrast here of the brown, and and, uh, and the rock's nice too, right up close. Uh, nice. Now we're back to another one of the ones we just looked at, because I doubled up on these. Now here's another one that's really nice. This one, of course, has a lot of um, uh, bright quality to it, and he's really doing a good job here with with light here, I like. And, but let's get back to scriptures here. Let, let's go to... We talked about patience, which is relative to your marathon as a Christian and all the scriptures that pertain to that, um, which is the word faithful, of course, and so forth. But let's move on. 20, and when ye shall see Jerusalem encompassed with army, armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Now, is this referring to the, the abomination of desolation, or is this referring to uh, Titus? I think it's referring to Titus. Let's move on. Now, 
Now, 21, uh, uh, as I clarify this, 21 makes me think about this referring to uh, not Titus so much as for, of course, uh, the end of the world, which is the middle of the, of the tribulation period, when the devil gets kicked out of heaven, and he can no longer go up to the heavens ever again. As a matter of fact, he, he's going down to the earth, and his next move is down below the earth. So he's getting lowered here. But here's my point. The, the point is he, he, got, he, he gets kicked out of heaven. He can no longer go there and fly around anymore. And so he's going to be angry, and he's going to come after the, the, the people who gave birth to Jesus Christ, who, who, who legally removed his authority. Because Jesus and the Father did not remove the authority from the devil on the earth uh, without doing it legally. See, the Father and Son love doing things legally. They are legal eagles. They, they like doing everything legal. It's amazing because Jesus Christ could have said, I want to forgive Jeremiah, and that's what I want to do. Instead, he said, I'm going to legally suffer for Jeremiah, and that's going to give him a free stand in heaven, just as if he never sinned. Okay? Now let's get back to the timeline here, because the chronology can be a little confusing, because the boss here, he's bouncing around chrono uh, time-wise, okay? Now, then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now we're talking about probably Petra and fleeing to the mountains. The devil's going to try to flood them as they run away into the city of Petra, and Michael's going to be there and protect them and so on. And uh, and, then, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein. In other words, don't come to the city right now because it is under attack. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So what vengeance is this? It's the vengeance of the people of Israel who did not accept Jesus Christ, their own uh, relative, and allow him to and assist him into being murdered horribly. And that's what's happening here. And it's happening in the time frame of Titus he's referring to, and in the middle of the tribulation period. Because both of these be, both of these events, which are Titus, 76 AD, and the middle of the tribulation period, which could probably be about four and a half years, three and a half years from now, uh, which is the rapture after the rapture, three and a half years after the rapture, then they are going to, of course, uh, experience the abomination of des desolation, and of course, the devil's going to come in there with humans and, and the beasts and the humans, and they're going to come in and say they're gods, they're going to rip their clothes, whatever, and they're going to run out of there because they can see it's the devil at that point. Right? And the devil's going to chase them, and they're going to have heavy persecution, and so on. That's what's going on here in 20 and 21, 22. So, but woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. Which means, watch out for not doing the right thing. That's what this is. You know, I'm laughing because, you know, this is funny in a way, because, you know, the people were laughing at him, and, mocking him, you know, and now look who's laughing, you know, you know, but woe unto them, uh, you, you can't even get out of town, you can't run fast enough, that's the point, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, stop right there, so that means that, that the, the governments that are going to be in charge, which could probably be the United Nations and so forth, they're going to capture these people and it's going to be based in Jerusalem and now they're going to be in these conditions until three and a half more years. That's relative to some other prophecies that might happen during those three and a half, but we'll let that go for now. And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring. So, is he going back to pre-tribulation? Because here, he's in the middle of the tribulation. 
in 25, is he going back to the middle of the tribulation? Or is he is he going back to the to pre-tribulation? See, that's the question a lot of Bible teachers have. I'm going to say he's going back to pre-tribulation. Let's continue. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be set, shaken. Stop right there. Now, that's obviously referring to the book of Revelation, seal number six. Seal number six is where all things are shaken, and it's really going to scare people half to death. Now, remember, there are a lot of people at this time who are going to continue to party, and they don't care really what happens. The earth can shake and go upside down. They're going to continue to do what, they're, what they do. But a lot of people are obviously going to be very sensitive to what's going on, and they're going to be shaken. They're going to be fearful and terrified. But there are going to be some people who are going to say, I don't care what the Lord does. I'm going to party and enjoy myself. I don't care what falls out of the sky. I don't care if the moon turns to blood red and the, the, the sun turns to black sackcloth and stars fall down from the sky and, 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 and seal number six. I, it doesn't bother me. Pass me a drink. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to curse God out. I mean, uh, I have a right to do that. And, and you, do have an you do have an option to do that. Oh, you don't have to love Jesus Christ. You don't have to acknowledge the fact that he died for, for your sins. You can, you can ignore it. But, uh, but the group we live in over here, uh-uh, we are going to acknowledge the Lamb of God. We are going to serve the Lamb of God. And as for me and my house, as Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. This is a beautiful painting. I like this one here. This is a very nice one from him. I think it's one of, one of his better paintings. A lot of continuity here, it's all the way across. Nice. Here we're back to the same thing again with him. A very simple uh, painting. A lot of uh, a lot of uh, freedom with color here. Maybe I don't know what that blue and the and the dark blue here. That's that's pretty nice. I like it. I think this is a really legitimate painting. I like it. We're gonna move on though. I like the shade there a lot. He's very good with shade. I like that. This guy is uh, he has some beauty here. This is nice. Now, this is one of the more moving ones. Now, most of your painters paint this painting, um, who are 17th, 18th, 19th century painters. They will all, uh, they must have did this in class, you know. <laughs> that they, they had to paint one of these monochromatic uh, sailboats sailing on some bay or shore, uh, you know. And, uh, and by the way, this is one of the f more favorable ones that I've seen, especially the sailboat. He does a really good job, in my opinion, this beautiful sailboat there, and a very good job. And, and, and I meant, let me mention something to you, just a little personal, not too personal. I spent a lot of my, my life on the beach, and I used to look, sit and look at the water. It, to me, it's just absolutely stunning, the glistening and so forth on the water. I would just sit and look, and, and, and it was so moving to me. I, I, I sensed the presence of Jesus Christ. In, in these kinds of paintings of stunning beauty from God's creation. Let's move on. We're going to let this one go. Here we have another standard from him, kind of a lot of color over here, color over there. Uh, nice job of the water here. Um, this is probably one of his lesser paintings. You can look in the background here and see that, you know, he can really give you some detail in the background here. This guy can paint, uh, in my opinion. It's I like his background here. I think he's emphasizing the background here. You know, in the distance there, you can see a really good image of some sort of a hillside there. You know, some sort of peninsula or whatever. And uh, I like it. I think this is a nice painting, especially the, the, looking in the distance here. That's pretty nice. That's pretty cool. Next painting. Okay, now we're back to something we've already looked at, but a different uh, distance here. Uh, once again, he's Mr. Green. I think this is better than the one we looked at earlier. And uh, I like this one. Let's get back to some scripture here. We're going to stop right here. Um, obviously, we're talking about Petra fleeing, fleeing for the 144,000, you might say. And um, they shall fall by the edge of the sword, uh, which specifically says a lot of people are going to be murdered here. Um, are they saved, the ones who are fleeing? That's a good question here that I'm going to address later on. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon. We just talked about that. That is also a cross-reference 
to Revelation chapter, what is that, 7 there. Um, men's hearts failing for fear, for looking out to those things coming on the earth. Uh, that goes back to the same chapter there where people are going to hide in the rocks. What's significant about this is that the Bible says they're not going to repent. When, when it says men's hearts failing, it's, 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 it might be referring to the Gentiles and the Jews. See, that's the point. I think it's referring more to the Gentiles. I think the Jews at this time are not going to be that much afraid because they know what's happening. Uh, but let, let's let that go. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. So now we're jumping ahead. We're jumping all the way, in my opinion, to the end of the tribulation period. Okay? The Battle of Armageddon. So, and then. So that might be the time frame there. Um, uh, let's continue to read. And when these things began, begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for redemption draweth nigh. So this is probably a reference to everyone. Uh, it could be to the Jews here. I need some more research on that. And uh, they're going to look up and they're going to see him. Uh, we know the Jews are, and they're going to feel bad because he's going to look like a Jew probably, and he's going to be wearing a robe, and they're going to say, that's Jesus. He's one of us. Okay, and uh, they're going to weep and so forth because look at him. That's the one that we murdered, and my grandparents did that, and now we want to believe in him because there he is, and he's in living color in the sky, etc., and uh, he's one of us. I'm going to believe on the gospel now, the everlasting gospel. Furthermore, we're running away from somebody who's murdering us and chasing us. So we need help. So that's why we have the, the real Hosanna here. Hosanna, Hosanna, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Why is he blessed to come to them in the name of the Lord? Because it's the name of the Lord. The first time he came, they, they didn't want to believe in the name of the Lord. Now they're ready to believe on the name. Now they're ready to receive the name, believe on the name, and to, of course, know the name now that God saves people who do what, what, what they're commanded to do at the River Jordan. Your own River Jordan, correct? Okay, um, uh, that's more of a Jewish kind of thing here, in my opinion. He does toss the Gentiles maybe in here too. It's inner inner mixture. I'm not going to try to find that right now. You know, which scripture refers to them and which scripture refers to everyone on the earth. And uh, obviously when they're hiding men, that men word it definitely means uh, Gentiles. Whether it's, it's Jews who don't want to be saved, who are hiding, I don't know. I, I think it's more along the lines of Gentiles. But let's let that go. Um, I think that the, the people who are the 144,000 who are running out of town, I think all of them are going to get saved. I got a feeling that, that they are going to believe on the everlasting gospel. But the people who are called men who are hiding in the rocks, those are Gentiles who have refused the gospel repeatedly. And Jesus in the clouds means nothing to them. All they want to do is run and hide and continue to party and do what humans do uh, without uh, embracing righteousness and embracing the gospel of uh, kneeling before the Son of the living God, correct? That would be my assessment. Let's continue. And he spake to them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when you see these things come to, to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Stop right there. So this is huge right now because the master is summarizing the, 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 the 40 years from now, from 33 AD, he's summarizing the pre-tribulation uh, uh, horror that we're in right now. He's summarizing when the three and a half years of peace, which the peace accord of the UN, the Pope, who knows, and the, the Mahdi or whatever they call him in, 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 in Muslim land, uh, when they all lied to the Jews and said, Peace to you. Now, that's what's going to happen here. And after three and a half years, he's giving a summary of what's going to happen when they turn on that peace agreement and attack them. Obviously, they're going to attack them at this time with the red dragon coming out of heaven 
uh, because he obviously goes up and down heaven and down into hell. He's going to come to the earth, come to the temple, and that's when they turn on them, and they're obviously going to flee, and all the horror that goes on with that, which is very similar to the horror that happened when Titus came. That's why people get confused. People get confused because they're basically the same horror. But, and the master uses vengeance, which means that you're getting what you asked for because you rejected the loving son of, of God, and that's not good. You said that he couldn't be, God couldn't come into a human body. Who are you to say that God cannot come into a human body? That's one of the big issues that went on during this time of 32, 33 AD, correct? Now, when, 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 the, when, the, when the fig tree comes into, into blossom, let's wrap this up. So that means that when the, when the, when the prophecy of the, the, the fig tree, which means that Israel became a nation in 1940-something, 1950, um, and I forgot the exact year, uh, they have a docudrama on that, where the UN decided to make them a nation and said, you can come back home, and it's your home, and the UN recognized them as a nation. Now, obviously, the, the, the Arabs were not too happy about this, and, of course, the British didn't know what to do. They were on the fence, because they were the military that controlled that region. Conflict, uh, what's, what are we going to do? What are the British going to do? The British want to be friends with the Arabs a little bit, and the Arabs want that territory, and the UN doesn't know what to do, and the UN decides to go ahead and grant them sovereignty, and, and so that is the time, the time frame of that a human being uh, lived 70 plus years. So you add 70 years to 1950 or so, uh, 1960, and you add 70 years to that, and what do you have? Everything he just said is going to happen. Now, relative to Titus coming, that is not relative to what, uh, that's the exception to what he has given. Everything else is applicable to all that's going to happen be in that generation. However, those who are raptured are not going to experience this. They are not going to experience these experiences because it's a day of vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. God is not going to bring vengeance on you. God is not going to bring his wrath on you. But since these people have rejected Jesus Christ, they're going to experience vengeance. Vengeance only goes to those who basically reject Jesus Christ and who reject the Ten Commandments and righteousness. That's who gets, gets vengeance. It's impossible for a Christian to get the vengeance of God and, of course, the wrath of God. It's impossible. You who are, John would say, walking in the truth. You may, be, you may get to the, uh, chastening the, to death, but that's not vengeance. Okay, let's wrap this up. As we talked about the, the 70 so years of a human, and so we're looking at in 70 to 1950 or whatever, uh, whatever the exact date was that they became a nation again. And of course, we have all this happening during that generation, which means 70 plus years and so forth. So you're looking at seven-year tribulation period. You're looking at seven years, 70 years, 60-something years. You do the math, whatever. Let's let that go for now. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. When the master says something, it's in stone. It's irrevocable. It's not going anywhere. My dad was that way. If my dad gave a law in the house, uh, you can bet your bottom whatever they say in America that, that, that whatever he said, it was in stone. My dad was like Cochise, you know, the Indian chief. He, you know, he was a leader and what, what, what said, what, what, what he said, it happened. Cochise, for example, he was speaking of him, uh, uh, you know, giving an interlude here or a digression, but uh, uh, Cochise told his, his, his fellow Indians there, the Apaches there, 
New Mexico, Arizona. He controlled both of those states, I think, for a long time in part of Texas. He was quite a general of the Apaches and so forth. He was a good organizer and a good archer, by the way. But Cochise told his men, don't murder white people for the, for the heck of it. We're not here to murder white people. And, 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 and if your relatives were murdered by white people, you, you, basically you cannot take vengeance out on any white person. That was his basic protocol. Cochise was a very exceptional individual. He was not a normal kind of guy. Uh, one guy tried to kill one of the uh, uh, ambassadors for the government, a white guy, and uh, Cochise shot him. The law is the law. Let's wrap this up and take heed unto yourselves. Think, pay attention, you, uh, lest at any time your heart be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this world, so that you are not so, pardon me, so that day come upon you unawares. In other words, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not, you're, you're not walking the narrow path. If you're walking the narrow path like we're doing right now, we are alert. We're not drunken here. We are paying attention. Pay attention. That's what we're doing right now. It's not going to come on me unaware of the rapture because I'm looking for it. That's the point. If you miss the rapture, this is going to, ha this is going to happen to you. You're trapped. Let's read the Master talk. To we're not going to look to the Matthew 24 cross-reference right now. There are some more cross-references here. Let's continue. And take heed to yourself, lest your hearts be overcharged. In other words, you, you just start desiring parties. Wee, let's get out there, man. Let's forget about church work. Some people, even the MAGA crowd, are drinking and and, and, and overcharged with, with the world. You know, the MAGA crowd's not necessarily church, is it? No. That's why we don't promote the MAGA crowd. Now, are, now are, we, are we supporting the MAGA crowd to a certain extent? Of course we are. They're Americans and they're decent people. Why wouldn't we support them? However, we support them in a different way. We pray for them, number one. We pray for them and the leaders, number one. Number two, we have church service. That's what we do here, basically. Almost every day here. It's not as though I can't go to a mega crowd meeting. Most of the people there are Americans and decent people, as far as I know. And they also, a lot of them are Christian people. However, does that mean they're mature Christians and they're doing the right thing? I don't know if I go along with that one. Because church is my priority here. I don't know about yours. And as far as Biden goes or wicked people, I don't have to fix Joe Biden's wagon or his son's wagon. God, God's going to do that. Now, if God uses some of these MAGA people to fix their wagon, well, that's, that's fine. But I, we have no protocol for that. Are you listening to me? I don't have a protocol. My protocol is, is, to, is to plant and water souls. That's my protocol. Can I make that a subtext to my life? I don't know. I guess you could. I don't see why not necessarily, but, but, but I'm not, I'm not going to uh, um, give any kind of directive uh, uh, for that protocol. Not me. Because we have church work to do here, and that's what I do. Okay? Let's continue where we're done. Basically, 34 is, in American terminology, uh, quit partying and enjoying yourself Oh, and just really just your heart is just really engaged in the world. Wee! Overcharged. You, you know, surfeiting means to be a party animal in drunkenness. So those words refer to, to the other words the master uses, such as, um, what's another word he uses? Um, uh, the word surfeiting, of course, is very similar to uh, consolation. There's a word. These are all synonyms for people out there in the world enjoying themselves. Whee! And not doing church work. 
which could apply to some of the mega crowd. Uh, I, I have a feeling that half of the people in the mega crowd are not going to be in the rapture because they're doing exactly what the master said here. The, the, uh, it's okay to party that, 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 that America's getting better. I, I don't mind that. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that per se. The problem is, is, is it going too far? That's, you know, I mean, where's church work? After church, you went to the MAGA crowd meeting. Well, I don't find that 100% bad, personally. However, I don't have protocol for it. Because we have church work, we have Bible study to do, and we have a sister of so-and-so across the street needs help. And that, but we have boots on the ground Christianity here in, in this ministry. Okay? If some of these Republicans are people who are going to make downtown cleaner and safer and so forth, right on. We say thank you. But we have no particular church definite protocol. That's my, that's my point. For as a snare shall it come on, come, come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. So it's a snare. You're trapped, people. If you miss the rapture, you are trapped. The people who made a peace accord, 144,000 or so in Jerusalem, they're trapped. Because the devil's going to say three and a half years of peace, probably the Pope or something, I don't know. And, 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 and they're going to say, peace, stop the war in Gaza, whatever. And let's have the, the red heifer and all the things that relate to Daniel's 70, 69th week are going to happen. And I'm not going to go there right now. But the point is, is that they're going to be trapped and snared along with the people who were partying as Christians and those who are Jews who signed a pact with basically the devil to have three and a half years of peace who appears to be a very nice guy in the new inn or something. A reformed Muslim or some sort, who knows? I, I haven't done enough research on that right now to, uh, to really get into identifying who exactly these people are, which are these two basic uh, leaders. Okay? One of them appears to be a, a pretend Jesus Christ, and another one appears to be more along the lines of a miracle worker or something. Or We'll let that go for now. Such as the Trinity has three, and the devil has his two uh, buddies, and so forth. We'll let that go for now. So it's a snare, and let's look at the scripture here, that dwell on the face. Stop right there. See, Jesus gives you science. Jeremiah gives you science here. We shut down. Uh, science means it's real. Okay. And what does the face mean? We already saw this painting here, a beautiful painting. And we're going around in circles. Uh, once again, we can get a good look at this guy. He is really a very nice painter. I really like him. Um, I left out some of his paintings that are very good. Um, I remembered in my head right now that some of his best paintings, but we don't have time for that right now, okay? I wish I had time, but I only have a little bit of time for art. It is something that we call what? Um, supplemental, you know. Um, uh, as we enjoy the beauty of this guy's paintings, we'll stop on this one. And, uh, and the show is over. And that's it. About an hour here, that's correct. Yeah, we have some more of his. I have some more in my collection, but we don't have time for that right now. I only have a certain amount of time, and I might show some of his other paintings later. He has some very nice paintings. So guess what? The show is over. And there you are, the people, and you've seen the show, and that's it. Jeremiah's going to shut the curtain, and we've enjoyed getting into this. I wanted to talk a little about science here. You, you, you can find science in your Bible, but you have to pay attention The master just said the face of the earth. What does that mean? That means the earth only has one face. And he says the face of a whole. So it's a whole face. So in spite of Americans believing that the earth is, the earth is round for 150 or 40, 40 years, uh, whoop de doo and la di da to all of that. Uh, Copernicus and Newton and all of this stuff, which is basically liars and confused people. It's not scientific. Copernicus or whoever. There are no globes anywhere. It's all your imagination. Watch you therefore and pray always, going back to the what scripture? 
going back to 2134, correct? Pay attention to yourself, man. Don't go out and party uh, and go wild. Even some of you young people, you know, stay alert. You know, until you're 18 years old, you're probably going to be in the rapture, which is cool. You're not at the age of accountability. You essentially can go out and party and act wild and commit adultery and so forth, which God hates. God hates sin. He's always hated it, and he will always hate sin. He's pure. And why he wants to tolerate me over these years, it's amazing. We call it amazing grace, how sweet the sound that showed mercy to somebody like Jeremiah. God hates sin 24-7. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. In other words, you can't stand before Jesus Christ if you're at a bar over here around the corner, you adults. You can't do it. But if you're standing here waiting, alert, busy, uh, uh, involved in the ministry and so forth, you can stand. Why? Because you were standing when he came. That's the point the Master's making. Stand. Walking on the narrow. Okay, that's what that means. I'm done. This has been a beautiful lesson. We went through uh, um, Luke's perspective on the end times. Matthew 24 is much more in, in, in depth, but we're going to let that go. Okay? I might cross-reference that uh, soon. So we can keep those two um, references together, those two um, recollections or records of what's going to happen here, prophecy. Uh, I also have, like I said, I, I have uh, Book 66, I can go right, through, go right through, excuse me, with you. And we also have, of course, Genesis, which I did a quick review over some of the basics. I did not go exhaustive into that particular uh, book, but I did go through a few things. And of course, next year or the end of this year, I'm going to go back through Genesis again. Because I'm going to have to highlight some things that I didn't do to be a thorough teacher, right? I'm going to go through book 66 quickly, and that's what I'm going to do. We're going to continue, we're going to continue with popcorn, and that's it. Now, who are we going to get into next? I don't have time for that right now. I think I want to move on. Um, I don't think I have time because we're probably going to go with, no, we don't have time. That's it. I wanted to show you who we're going to hit, who we're going to go to next here um, in my um, popcorn and art and the painters and popcorn, the painters of his glory is what I'd probably call it. The painters of his glory. For thine is the kingdom, thine is the power, thine is the glory forever. Jeremiah is wrapping it up. That's it. Shalom means peace. My peace I give unto you, John 14. And we just rejoice in the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding. That's it. Amen.